Nope. All right, um, I'll go try to switch it out. Have, have I got a few minutes? Uh, look, uh, you, you're just going to need to do your best because unfortunately we're a bit too late now. We've got so much we need to do at this point. I'll let you do whatever you can do. But I won't um, be able to check it with you kind of thing. Okay. Thank you. at top of the hour um, and use this first with, um, if you have a look at the run sheet the first five or six stories are going to run before we go with you and then we're going to drop into you but um, in terms of making your audio sound good there's nothing I can do now I'm Greg and uh, he's not John. John is somewhere driving in the middle of um, near Dubbo, I think. I got a message from him a minute ago. Hi, mate. I'm driving back from Dubbo. Hope to stop at some stage soon when I can get reception. So 
literally a couple of minutes ago, we had Lloyd here and uh, I thought, well, let's throw him into the mix. And at the moment, speaking of the mix, my face looks very washed out. Yeah. Um, let me see if I can fix that. I'll turn that light off. That's a little bit. Ooh, what was yes. that? And I don't know, but you're kind of fading. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> This is almost a Halloween episode. Oh, now. Mm-hmm. Okay. My producer went and pressed some buttons that she didn't know what she was doing. <laughs> and now I'm turned in, turning into a ghost. Okay, tell you what. You're going to come over here and you're going to come on camera, baby, and I'm going to go and do what we do. Yes, I need you. I can't do, boy. It's I not going to help. With this. <laughs> well, hello, screen. everyone out there. <laughs> this is not normally how this show <laughs> runs, but it is today. You're the one who pressed the buttons. <laughs> it's really Halloween. <laughs> My uh, goodness, I hate you. And our guest is sitting here uh, in the background because I can see him over there, and he's like, "Hello, everyone." Oh my God. Okay. All right, am, am I still in the shop by myself? Yeah, I am. Okay, so I'm... Okay. All right. Well, anyways, folks, uh, Greg will be back pretty soon. Uh, and I'm sitting in for John, and I have no clue what I'm doing. So I'm just sitting here. So enjoy the show. Enjoy the uh, comedy of errors. Uh, let me see. Oh, look, I've got a... I can take that and move. Oops, move that over here. There we go. Nope, that didn't work. Uh, anyways, uh, eventually we'll get this under control. You know, this is the problem. See, Greg had everything set up. Everything was working perfect for almost 30 minutes. And then he tweaked and he <sighs> touched. And, you know, something oh, that I would. Looks awful. That looks Wait absolutely minute, awful. I'm on here by myself. It better not, <laughs> Greg. That no, no, no. I'm just looking at the preview of the shot. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. I'll tell you. I'll tell you guys what actually happened before the show started. And my, I'm going to leave you on screen. Can you, my, my producer? Can you bring up the um, webcam properties thing? We're just going to quickly do a white balance of my camera again. This was working beautifully earlier today. Well, yeah, that's what I was explaining to everybody. You had it all set up with kicking back, relaxing, and whenever you got a show that goes that well, you know something's going to happen at the last minute, and it did. And redo the green screen thing for me, please, as well. The uh, mouse. Yeah, hang on. Stay oh. there, Lloyd. Sorry. Oh, that's, yeah, well, you know. Uh, <laughs> Thunderbird 6 says, hello, world. You too, Grumpy. Okay. <laughs> Hey guys, uh, and just so you know, this is the Oz by Drone show. This is not the Grumpy Vlogger show. It's just that, you know, I was here doing stuff in the background and uh, uh, that's, you know, how it works. But uh, I have, you know, I didn't, he didn't even tell me I was going to do this until about three seconds before we went live. And then they jumped out and Left me just kind of hanging in the wind. So, hey, I do have something I'll talk about while we're waiting on Greg. Uh, for those of you that speaking have been of following... waiting, I am here. Is this okay oh, you now? Are. Let's see. Oh, there you go. There you go. That's better. Uh, you don't look this... like you don't look all pasty white now. One of the things about doing live shows is being ready heaps before the show and having all of the people in the shots and all of that kind of stuff, and then. The, the show goes live to air at five minutes too, as we know the hour. And at that point, I didn't have a co-host and my guest arrived a little bit late today as well due to technical issues on his computer and we still have audio things. But anyway, let's forget all of that and we're going to get stuck in too. And with all of that, I don't even have my titles up on my screen at the moment. So let me go and press that button as well. Uh... Here we go. This is going to go well yep. from here on in. Let's get started with the news. Okay, our first story today, as we get into the news, obviously DJI have been doing their thing and they've released the Mavic Mini and we'll play the video in the background of the Mavic Mini as we chat about it. 
So yes, after many months of leaks and rumors, they've officially unveiled the product, an exceptionally light palm-sized foldable drone that's portable and easy to fly, designed for safety and perfect for everyone who wants to experience the fun of flying. Um, or at least those are the words that come from Petapixel. But what is interesting about the drone, um, who is it that they're targeting? We're the traditional drone market here, and we've got a lot of flyers. Um, what, what's your first comment, Lloyd? What do you think? Does it fit for us? No, it's, I mean, I could see a beginner person in drone community, maybe starting out with something like this, but I think they're going after a new audience because, you know, let's face it, the, the drone community as we know it is aging <laughs> and we want bigger and better, you know? And so they need to keep their, they need to keep their market fresh. So they're going for the lower end beginning, uh it's uh, i mean it's got some nice features and i was in a chat that yesterday and the one person was kept saying it was a girl she kept saying but it's cute okay i'm not into cute myself i want something that's going to function but hey it's cute so i guess they're going after the ladies with the little drawy things you know and uh so you can scribble on your drone I don't I know. mean, <laughs> for me, for me I, I'm happy with most of the stuff, right? So as we look at the features, the takeoff weight we know is 249 grams, but by the time you add a memory card and potentially a sticker with your phone number, getting very close to that kind of 250 weight limit before you've got to register it. So that kind of almost defeats the purpose. And don't put any prop guards because then you're really stuffed. That'll put you way over. So that's the first concern. But moving on, the other good stuff, um, the speed that it can do, as expected for its um, size, four meters per second in sports mode and so on, um, descent speeds, wind speeds, etc. It can handle um, 13 meters per second. That's kind of reasonable um, near sea level. Um, maximum ceiling, it's able to fly um, 3000 meters above sea level, but obviously it's not gonna let you fly that because you, know, you need to keep um, it within a reasonable height. Right. Flight time, 30 minutes. Okay, fair enough. All of those kind of things, good. Some tilt angles and all of that kind of stuff. Here's the, the rub for me. The rub for me is what are they doing about the connectivity? It's just basic Wi-Fi. And having a look at the, the drone in the US, particularly the US FCC market, it's a 5.8 gigahertz drone only for the US market. Now, there's two models of the drone. That's an interesting one. Did you know there were two models? I I had I just discovered that. <laughs> but no, I didn't. When this all came out, I thought there was just the one for everything. And and the difference in the two models are So in the FCC filing, they said it's 5.8 only locked, even though we've got a standard Wi-Fi chip that can do 2.4 and 5.8, but it said we're only going to do 5.8, but for the non-US market, they're also doing 2.4 and 5.8, splitting across those frequencies depending on your particular location, but at a lower power output. So um, that's an interesting one. I had read that it was locked to um, 5.8, but yeah, interesting. But for me, um, the, the range is the biggest concerning factor. I mean, I saw someone who took it out over water and they got to just over two kilometers over water, which is doable. Um, they say right. it's meant to be able to get four kilometers. But if you've got that kind of range just over water with no obstructions, no nothing, um, that kind of makes me question that kind of information. Yeah, that that four kilometer range. Uh, I, I, somebody put it best in one of the others. the The four kilometer range is uh, if you're, let's say, on Mars with no obstructions, <laughs> nothing there. You could probably get it. The problem is, is not many of us are going to be flying our drone on Mars. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Just, you know, that's that's. It's a great gimmick for the younger crowd, for the beginners, for people that want to do, well, there's the same ones that want the new iPhone every time it comes out. You know, those of us that are, you know, we want something that's functional and not necessary that is glitzy, you know. Yeah, this, this is targeted. Is, this, is, this is ultimately a targeted drone for your mid-teens to mid-20s. I think that's where it's, they're trying to market it at. And that's not such a bad thing either. Um, I think this no. has got a place 
but it's not in your traditional drone market. That's my opinion anyway. But let's move on. We've got our second story of the day today, and we're going to have a look at this particular crater. So uh, the Kilauea crater has been water sampled using a UAV. On 26th of October, the US Geological Survey um, had a look at the um, Hawaiian volcano from their observatory, and they took an important step in unlocking the secrets of this body of water. Social media post from Hawaii Volcanoes National Park announced they launched a specialized unmanned aircraft system to gather photographs and gas measurements and a water sample from the scalding hot surface. Once the data is analyzed, they will announce their findings in the very near future. Really good use of drones and aircraft for science and research and finding out what's in there because, you know, you can't get there through other methods. Yeah, it's an excellent way of doing it and uh, it's cost effective too. I mean, well, I mean, you're just not endangering lives. I mean, because the way they've done it before is they have to have somebody go creep up onto the uh, scalding hot water and get that. And this way they can get it right out in the center where it's probably at the deepest they get a uh, best reading that way. Yeah. A good water sample. Yeah. Yeah. Our third yeah. story today, infection detection. Did you know you can use drones to detect infections? No, I didn't. Well, according to this one, University of Washington and Stanford University, they've got together and they've discovered clues in the environment that can help identify transmission hotspots for schistosomiasis, a parasitic disease that is second only to malaria in its global health impact. The research published on 28th of October in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences uses rigorous field sampling and dogs barking and aerial images to precisely map communities that are at the greatest risk of shit. So let's go and play that video. Chelsea Wood, I am a parasite ecologist and I study the ecology of the human disease schistosomiasis. So schisto is a trematode parasite. It's a flatworm and it lives inside the human circulatory system and it needs two hosts in order to complete its life cycle, people and snails. So it lives in the blood vessels of people, there it produces eggs, those eggs are passed out of the body in urine or feces, and then they go into natural freshwater bodies like streams or rivers or lakes. The snails then incubate the parasite and they just pump out millions of clones of this parasite and they penetrate the skin of people who are bathing in those freshwater bodies. What you wind up seeing in patients who've been infected for a long period of time with a large number of worms is abdominal pain and distension and ultimately bladder cancer or liver cancer. It's awful. So I'll just um, put the volume for that down a little bit, but ultimately what they're doing, they're taking aerial images of the, the water supplies in the area in question. They're having a look at that and because of the color of the water um, and other images from those drones, they can actually say this area is susceptible to this disease or it is not susceptible simply based on the color of the water um, and some other algorithms they've got in there. Um, the, the alternative to that previously, they needed to send people out into the water, wading out into the water, as you can see here, um, literally going and looking yeah. for, for those um, snails in the, in the water. So it's a really good way to detect the presence of the disease and to treat it. Okay. Once again, a yeah, really just, cool use of drones. Absolutely. It's just, I mean, they're just coming up with newer and newer ways to use a drone. I mean, it's something that's here to stay. Uh, I think that's just the way it's going to be. It's here to stay. And I think they're going to find more. And the, the thing is, the more uses they find for a drone, the more legitimate good uses the better it is for all of us. Absolutely. And speaking of good uses of a drone, we've all heard about the um, Uber Eats and eating is one of the very important things. We've got a photo of one of their new aircraft that I just wanted to share with you all today. This is really cool. So we've got a VTOL aircraft, vertical takeoff and landing. And if you have a look at that, you can imagine the, the body of the aircraft staying as it is, but it's the, the actual wing of that is rotating and pivoting and changing the direction of thrust. Really cool right. design. That is cool. Okay. 
We'll move on to one more story, and this one is um, speaking of delivery, and I'm going to have a laugh because I didn't notice this beforehand. I've got a typo in my title slide, but that's okay. Delivery on a submarine. (laughs) (laughs) Ah, It's all good. Um, This is another interesting photo. This is a a delivery to a submarine being conducted by drones. So again, a great use of drone technology to to do things that we couldn't do before that. Um, Submarines being uh, supplied by drone, another good use of the technology. But speaking of technology, let's just play this video. This is an older video that happened to be on the same slide. Um, when when I found that news story today, and it's just a really cool um, design. It's a VBAT design of something that they're using in the military as well. Yeah, Martin. This is not Marietta, bigger big, one of the biggest suppliers for this stuff. Yeah, this is not new, but just the actual aircraft itself is an interesting design. So I thought, let's go and have a look at it. Yeah. Looks like an X-Wing fighter. Star Wars. <laughs> wow. Now, I was about to go to our guest in a couple of moments, but he's disappeared off the screen, so we'll continue with a few news stories. But yeah, this one again, it's just an interesting design of what they're doing with drones again, that VBAT X-Wing design. Did we lose our guest completely? He's not on the screen at the moment. Ooh, I see that. So let's move on to our next story for the moment. We'll leave that one there. And next on the list, California Power. For those who aren't US based, you will have heard that there's power outages happening in California at the moment. And, you know, everyone gets power outages from time to time. But in this case, we've got millions of people without power. And what's interesting is that there's been some pictures taken showing the aging PG&E transmission towers in California. And just having a look at that, I don't know if you can see it on that photo, but to me, it looks like it's very much rusted out. From what I can tell in some of the articles that have been published is that there's literally thousands of risk items that have been documented by PG&E that wouldn't have otherwise been able to have been discovered without the use of drones. Again, another great way to use drones for the benefit of the public. Well, these pictures, you know, uh, 400 AGL was actually there doing that. That's... uh, that was part of now that he's away from that and there's no NDA involved. That's what he was doing, taking those pictures. So very well could be some of those pictures we're looking at were taken by Mel himself. So in that uh, area as they well? were doing, uh, California. Uh, yeah. Yeah. They, they yeah. All over California. He, he was up and down that area for, I don't know, four months, three months, however long he was out there. And that's what he was doing was for PG&E. He was working for them. He's working for another company who was contracted. But at the time, he couldn't talk about it, who he was actually contracted with. But, uh, you know, he's no longer contracted with them. But he uh, uh, he was taking those pictures that one of those pictures right there. He would he would be taking the picture while another pilot uh, pilot in command uh, operated the uh, uh operated the uh, uh ah there we go he's got a sound uh okay we've got our guest coming yeah. back in the background so while we're waiting yeah. for him we might play um our next we'll do our next segment of the news quickly and we'll see if we can make sure his audio is working first so let's do that now so next on the list we're going to look at a volo super volo in this case <laughs> this is a hybrid gas electric drone so You know, we've seen hybrid vehicles around for a while. Why not drones as well? Let's have a look. Now, this one, we can see here, there's no audio to this clip, but you can see that they're filling it up with some some gas. Um, But certainly the range of that as well is a lot longer than your traditional drone, obviously, a combination of 
gas and electric together. This one is uh, done with a collaboration between Autirian um, together with GE Aviation. Okay. Yeah, I think that I think that's awesome. It's gas powered, so. Yeah, absolutely. So just reading the article here, the collaboration enabled us to offer large commercial UAVs, um, a full solution with um, airborne, airborne autopilot and application computing hardware, flight management, safety management and integration. GE Aviation provided the avionics hardware, the computing and the airframe integration, says Autirian. So it looks, looks very interesting. But we've got a second one. So that's a hybrid, but we've got another similar aircraft. And let's just play the next clip for a minute. Innovative, bold, dynamic. Since 2011, we have been pioneering mobility of the future with our manned and fully electric vertical... So this one is called Volocopter. Now, we've seen this kind of one before with the airborne taxis. Um, but this one is a cargo drone, so a very similar design to their air taxis. This one's um, certainly got a lot of power and a lot of lift. Let's just listen. Groups ...for a cargo variant of the Volocopter. As a result, in 2018, we launched a utility drone project as a largely independent activity within Volocopter. With the Volo drone, we're introducing a new unmanned product based on our original platform, and expanding our leading position in sustainable and fully electric VTOLs to a host of new applications. Introducing the Volodrome by Volocopter, a drone which is ushering in a new era of urban and rural flight and offers unlimited potential. Progressive, efficient and fully electric. So we'll leave that there, but a really cool aircraft design. We've seen that kind of frame before, certainly with the air taxis, but being used for cargo as well going forward with that new product. Can they attach a fishing chair though? Can they attach a fishing chair? Would they do that? Because they might get in trouble from CASA. <laughs> Just had to go there, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's leave that there for the moment, and we're going to move on to our guest now. And our guest is sitting in the in the green room in the back. Let me see if I can press the right buttons to get him to come up on screen. And hello, Tom, are you there? Are you there, Tom? Okay, we've got no audio. He had audio a few minutes ago. We've got your audio. Yeah. Can you hear him, Lloyd? No, I, I, I can't hear him now. I heard him tapping his. Yeah, nothing. Okay. It was working. So, okay, so here's what we're going to do. We did have audio. We're having a fun day today. Oh, there, oh, we, there go. we go. Tom, we have you. Hi. Thank you. Sorry. Sorry about that. Nice to meet you. Yeah, thank you for joining us. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Where are you and what do you do for a day job? Hello? Hello? Can you hear him, Lloyd? Uh, Lloyd's gone away to deal with the dogs. Can we go to the split screen again? Maybe that will work. Let's go to that. Yeah. Uh, no, the one with me. You there? All I can say is there's definitely some ghosts getting involved in the production of this show today. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to play a video that is from Tom's school channel. Let's go and play that video now and I'll have a look at the audio while it's playing out. Let's watch it. The Seton High School UAV Specialist Program is South Australia's first integrated program combining Stage 1 Geography and Scientific Studies and Stage 2 Control Technology, all framed around UAV application in industry. We've rethought SACE and what we've realised is that it's more engaging for students and teachers. It provides the students with the real world integrated projects instead of work that's confined to just one subject area. A program where students have excelled in many other subjects and have shown interest in STEAM. I applied for the Seton UAV program 
because I, I was fairly interested in the idea of working with drones. The UAV program is a course where we study uh, drone use and drone technology. Right now we're studying the use of drones in the agriculture industry. The Seton High School UAV Specialist Program has many connections with industry. We've got the University of Adelaide, government departments and local UAV businesses. So I started off working in the defence and IT industry in Adelaide and then after a few years of doing that I was able to get um, some experience together both with business and drones and so I was able to split off and start working for myself in my own consultancy. My work with drones has been pretty broad. I've been lucky enough to work um, with defence drones and then also in the civilian sector where I've worked in training and also with scientists uh, who do things like track environmental problems with drones. Working with the Seton UAV program has been an excellent opportunity to see how we take the latest technology which is available to everyone and how students are able to use that technology to explore what they can do technically and what they can do entrepreneurially. I think it's amazing the technology, it's come so far and it's um, really interesting to see what sort of jobs you can get. By completing the UAV program, okay. students... I think we've got audio back from Tom. Let's so see if you're there. Are you there, Tom? I'm here. Hi, how are you okay. going? Good, good, good. I'll just turn the volume down on that video clip and you can talk to us about Excellent. it instead. Where are you from, Tom? Uh, we're based in Adelaide in South Australia. We're one of five entrepreneurial specialist schools um, across the state. And uh, my role as assistant principal of entrepreneurial education and specialist programs is working with our fantastic teaching staff and connecting with industry to really put together uh, programs where students can embrace um, emerging technologies such as the UAV program um, and get industry qualifications to really put them in a great position to be um, successful problem solvers and problem identifiers in the future and uh, have qualifications that are going to put them in a really good position to be successful. Okay. And in terms of your program, you, are, are you... Is this something that's aligned with an aviation qualification? Because I know that in, in New South Wales that we've got our TAFE scheme in New South Wales and there's actually an aviation drone-related set of qualifications now available. Is that also the case in South Australia? Uh, yep, so we co-deliver the industry qualification with the University of Adelaide and their unmanned research aircraft facility. So students uh, go through the program and get their remote pilot's licence that allows them to operate commercially up to seven kilos. Um, yep. And they also get their aeronautical radio operator certificate. Okay, and where did this come from originally? Like who's our, your idea, the school's idea? Where did it come from? Because I think it's great. Uh, yeah, I um I was always very um passionate about technology. I'm a design and technology teacher. Um but I think uh, several years ago myself and a, a team of teachers really really connected with um the University of Adelaide people like Leanne Pinco and um uh, the unmanned research aircraft facility there and saw how they were using drone technology and drone qualifications to solve um, environmental problems. And uh, um, it seemed to really align well with our curriculum. So we teach um, year 11 and 12 robotic and engineering systems. Uh, we have scientific studies, but we wanted to create a program where students could basically uh, use this technology and explore the technology, um, 3D printing, advanced manufacturing, coding, um, in a framework where they were working with industry to solve real world problems. So students engage in this program in one fully immersive uh, day a week for the whole year, and they get their industry qualifications as well as credit for year 11 and year 12 subjects. Okay. okay. So and we, we find that the students find this really engaging and a great way um, to, to tackle real world problems. And it's, it's a bit more of an entrepreneurial approach to, to your traditional classroom structures. Okay. I'm curious if other schools, either in South Australia or um, in other states, wanted to do a drone program and with the target of getting the same qualification, is there an easy way to go and make that happen? Do you need to partner with someone? Can they do it themselves? Is there the right material available? Um, I think it is It is possible to connect with industry and have students engage in um, obtaining the industry qualifications. We've put a lot of time and effort into connecting in, in, with industry and training our teachers to go through, um, a, get the qualifications themselves and be able to deliver 
um, deliver those qualifications uh, along with the university at, at a very high standard. Obviously, um, responsible drone use and aviation. So it's, in, um, it's an area within education um, that I think there's been a lot of uh, progress recently, but we really wanted to be at the forefront of responsible drone operation and education for young people in, in South Australia. And we're the first people doing it in South Australia, uh, offering the qualification. But yeah, we're really happy to to share and um, share our knowledge and and um, get as many people involved as possible because it's a, it's a great program. Students are super engaged in it. We're getting fantastic outcomes and and we have a lot of um, qualified and responsible drone operators, which is always a great thing. Okay. And how many students, has anyone completed the program yet or is it in the early stages where people are starting the course? Yeah, we're, we're in our second year of completing the course. So we've got uh, 38 qualified uh, pilots that have gone through the program now. Based on that, we've got one student who's currently um, working with the pilot program um, with Life Saving SA. Um, as part of the drone um, shark spotting team. We've got another student who's doing um, some work experience with NFN Power Networks with their um, chief remote pilot. So we're now that we're getting out there, we're really connecting students um, with industry and students are, are able to use their qualification in an entrepreneurial way. We've got yeah. students doing their um, research projects. Uh, one student's looking at using drone technology to uh, monitor dolphin populations within uh, the Port Adelaide um, River system. So it, it's it's amazing to see uh, with the qualification and the skills that they learn how they can be entrepreneurial in the way of applying it, which is what we want out of our young people. And certainly having a look at the example we saw out of California in the news earlier today, um, PG&E have literally thousands of identified risks that they couldn't have otherwise found without drones. So, you know, partnering with power line companies in, in South Australia, and we know that there's a lot of common um, parallels with California. They've got a big hydro, hydro scheme. I believe you've got a lot of hydroelectricity over there, or is it other types of um, renewables? Uh, we, yeah, there's a, a lot of uh, wind. There's a lot of renewables in South Australia. We're also um, teaming up with the environmental sector, looking at how we can implement drone technology and um, low altitude aerial surveys um, in order to um, more effectively identify weeds of nets and also working with an organisation called Land for Wildlife, looking at using drone technology with mapping Phytophthora dieback. So there are two other areas where um, we we seem to be uh, one of the first uh, people involved with uh, using that technology for environmental problems in that space. So it's, it's really exciting to see young people exposed uh, to the technology and applying it in really creative and innovative ways. Okay. I'm curious, what's the most common drone that your students use when they're um, coming to class? Do they have their own or have they, you got a fleet of your own ones within the school? Uh, yeah, we do a lot of our training. Um, the organize, the University of Adelaide uses uh, Mavics as training drones just to um, accrue flying hours. Um, we do a lot of mapping with our, our Phantom 4 our, um, and our Parrot Sequoia uh, multispectral camera. Mm -hmm. um, and we've got a, it's a bit of an older drone, an Iris, uh, that we can use with Archer Pilot to have students more familiar with um, creating autonomous missions. So, um, yeah, systems integration is a big focus of our program as well. So students are, are um, 3D printing, designing and uh, prototyping a autonomous hopper deploy mechanism that we can, we're testing or prototyping to deploy herbicide on um, weeds of national significance. So looking at utilising that technology as a more effective way um, uh, with weed management in the environment. So that's obviously in its early stages, but it, it's amazing to see some of the results that we've already got. Absolutely. Um, just for those people who are watching us today, we've got Nightbot putting up a link to your channel um, on the screen just a moment ago and also in the chat room. Please do go and have a look at that if you're interested in what uh, what they're doing at, at the high school there. Um, what, one more quick question. Have you got any of your students who are doing non-stabilized flying as well? So not the GPS, but the you know the more acrobatic kind of flying as well. Is that something that they're they're playing with as well? 
Uh, yep, the the students um, have access to the Wizard two two twenty. So um, a lot of students do um, or are interested in more of the drone racing side of things as well. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, we we kind of really try to expose students in diverse range of interests. But once again, just really showing them the potential of the tech and letting them really run with it in an entrepreneurial way. Okay, we're having a little bit of fun. Your internet there is glitching a little bit as well. So it's been a fun day for technology today. Um, what I might do now, um, we're going to play FPV Corner and I'll get you to stick around if you've got some time in the chat, answer some questions, say hello to a few of our viewers as well. And let's, uh, let's go and play today's FPV Corner. Thank you very much for being our guest though today. It's been great to talk to you. Fantastic. Really appreciate it. Okay. Let's play that clip now and um, we'll continue with the news in a little bit. Excellent. There we go. So FBV Corner is, um, you know, I was asking you if your students are interested in the non-stabilized flight. And this is one of our regular segments that we do on the show each week, showcasing some of the creative side of, of flying. And this one's a, a video by Shock, Shock Sticks is the name of the pilot. Um, if you want to go and check out the video, any of our viewers, go and have a look at the comments for this week's show and you'll be able to find a link to his channel there. This one was flown at Les Murdy Falls during the most magical hour, the golden hour as they call it. And this is the video that came out of that. Um, Here's an interesting one. The frame is actually a Banggood Cockroach V2. So Banggood is a website that I've generally steered clear of, but being able to use Banggood um, components for creating your FPV drone, yes, it is possible. Yeah, this is some awesome flying. Where's Les Murdy Falls? Have you, have you heard of that at all? to our teacher. <laughs> uh, no, sorry, I, I, I haven't heard of it. It's some stunning footage though. Absolutely amazing work. Yeah. This one's actually in Western Australia from what I can tell. So there's Murdy Falls picnic area. So what are the different types of um, drones that your students do have in the FPV kind of freestyle space? You mentioned one. Is there any others that they fly? No, predominantly it's uh, just the wizards that they've been using um, at the moment. But um, I think with things being a lot more affordable these days and, and them being a lot more co um, competent with, with their flying and a lot more have a lot more confidence mm. in their flying, it'll be excited, exciting to see um, yeah, where they go with it. Yeah, absolutely. And that's today's clip from FPV Corner. Thank you to Greg Hilton, as always, for putting that together. And thanks very much for being with us today as well and talking about your school, what they're doing. Um, again, if you want to stick around, by all means, um, hang around in the background. We'll, we'll bring you in if there's anything interesting. We'll continue with a few of our news stories. Or if you've got to go off, that's fine as well. Go and have a chat in the chat room. And yeah, thank you very much for being with us today. Stick around so, and I really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, thanks again. Okay, so moving on with our news, we're going to have a look at um, a rejected story. You know what? I actually have one more question for you. I've got one more question. Have you um, heard about the, the Mavic Mini drone, the, the, the new DJI release? And do you think that's a good fit for you from an education perspective? Yeah, um, some of our students are quite excited about um, the the new release, and I think uh, yeah, from a student perspective, uh, that is a, that is a good fit. Um, I'm I'm confident with the responsible use of drones uh, amongst all of our students. So I obviously really want them pursuing drones uh, that that can allow them to kind of uh, operate in industry. But I think as a as a recreational drone, it's a it's a really exciting. Uh, product. One of our students who's actually going on to do 
um, to do his uh, commercial pilots qualification at the University of South Australia. He's actually really interested in, in that drone as well. So Yeah. I yeah. mean, I, I, was, I was talking about it a little it's bit exciting. negatively before, but I think actually the education sector is one place where it can be um, a good fit. Um, it's something from a price point, it's going to be certainly a lot more affordable. Um, it's a step up from the Tello, which is obviously a very, very simple, cheap, lightweight drone. Um, yeah, I think that could yep. be a good fit. We do, we do a bit of work with the Parrot Mumbo as a, as a small um, training drone. But yeah, I think we need something kind of in between the, the Mavic Pro and the, and the Parrot Mumbo space. So yeah, I think that would be a really good fit and we'll be definitely looking into it. Yeah. Okay. Look, thanks again. Sorry for bringing you in right at the end. We're going all over the place today. So let's get back to our news. And we're going to go to this story, which is um, story number eight from my producer. DJI have been rejected. <coughs> and certainly in the USA, we've heard a lot of um, talk about the legislation in the, U in the US. Um, DJI say they are disappointed to learn that the US Interior Department has grounded all non-essential China-made drones. So the Interior Department, the federal agency responsible for maintaining America's vast federal lands is saying, sorry, you can't fly that drone. Um, Lloyd, you're, a, you're, a, you're an American guy. Talk to me. What's, what's the feeling around in the US about this one? You know, uh, I don't know. There's... I listen to some of the drone people and they're, you know, they're upset by it. And it's, it's really a bunch of politics. I think in, in either way, it just means I won't be able to fly my SEMA X eight HW, you know, for the government now. So I'll have to get some, a real drone, but no, it's, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but no, it's, there's always potential for something and you know they could they could make it have an american made drone and uh they could have programmers you know set stuff up to still send stuff to china i'm not sure what they're trying to do i think a lot of it has to do is they're wanting to go american made and as uh, a citizen of this country yeah i think we should but that's the problem mm. we've let things go overseas so long that we don't have anybody who's really pushing the innovation you know let me just here. comment from, from my perspective on why this has happened the early versions of the dji go 4 app actually had code in there to allow dji to update and modify and self-patch the app right. without without the google app store knowing without the apple app store knowing and DJI could just do anything they wanted. Um, that has changed a lot. They've taken out that code because it was exposed. It was put out there for the world to know what they were doing. But as we go forward, they've secured the app a lot, but the reputational damage I think has already been done. That's the challenge. And that's people within politics are going and clinging on to that and saying, well, we're gonna use that as a reason to to ban this, but the reality is it's for political reasons. They want to say we want American made. Yeah, well, and that there's a lot of They're doing of it on the that. back of the security. They're doing it on the back of the security reason, which is there gone. Again, it's one of those if they spied on us once, maybe they'll spy on us again. Who knows? Uh it's I don't know. I, I I'm of course, like I always say, what do I know? I'm a vlogger. I, I just fly a drone, you know. <laughs> I'm not a drone expert. Yeah. But I'm sure there's, you know, it's it's like everything. It's an opinion. Everybody's got one. And well, there needs to be, then, yeah, there needs to be something where you can specifically load up firmware only from U.S. government authorized sites. Just imagine if, you know, what what was the name of the department? This is the U.S. Interior Department. Just Interior imagine, department, yeah. yeah, just imagine if they are the people instead of from DJI servers, it was from their servers that the firmware came from. And the DJI allowed them to vet um, the security aspects and elements of that code. Then, when they're under control, there'd be no reason to um, to have this kind of a response. Maybe that's the answer that DJI needs to look at. Well, it probably is. And also, you, you're talking the Interior Department. They're in charge of our parks. They're in charge of uh, our Native American situations the casinos and all that different stuff 
it's not like uh, the, uh, you know, it's not like the Central Intelligence Agency or anything like that. Because obviously we've we've shown enough news lately about some of these drones that they've got. They've got their own drones. So mm. that are being set up for that stuff. But this this the Interior Department there. They're sort of like the Postal Service of, of it. You know, they're not really that. Oh, OK, so they can't fly. The Rangers can't use them to chase elk up in uh, Yellowstone National Park. You know? Mm. Yeah. OK, moving on from that, our next story is an interesting one. It's um, a story about UFOs and you and your, um, your, your connections, Lloyd. I thought this was an appropriate one to, to have you around for. <laughs> Yeah, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> so this one, there's been a study done. Um, encroaching drones are not usually visible to pilots approaching a runway. Let me say that again. Encroaching drones are not usually visible to pilots approaching a runway. During an airborne human factors experiment, certified pilots failed to see a common type of quadcopter. They didn't see it in 28 out of 40 close encounters. And for the other ones that they did see it, they knew that there was a drone coming and they were looking out for it. So during a right. regular, and this was on a Cessna. So during a regular flight where you're flying, uh, you know, a commercial Boeing or Airbus aircraft, during a regular flight, a drone would be so unlikely to be detected, which brings into the question, the validity of previously reported drone sightings. And I put up a, a graphic, a video of some UFOs coming in because at the end of the day, if they did see something at all, it's an unidentified flying object. It's not a drone. And I've been saying this for a long time. That's not to say that there's ch challenges and issues with making sure that people fly safe. We absolutely need to make sure that people fly safe and don't yeah. fly near airports. But the point yeah, it, is, it's like Mad Kiwi says, his air disappears about 50 feet. That's why I went ahead and got the, the Loom Cube strobe because I couldn't see my air from the ground when I was flying it, you know, and that and I do not fly high at all. You know, I think the highest I've ever flown is 90 feet up because, you know, I'm not a drone person, so I don't fly it enough to have the. But you enjoy it and that's fine. I enjoy and you're it, flying yeah. safe and that's fine. Yeah. I'm just tired of these drone sightings. And, you know, the subtitle for that story that I put up there uh, was Pink Elephants, UFO Pink Elephants. You remember a couple of weeks ago, we actually had a story, a legitimate story, where a commercial pilot flying, I can't remember if it was an Airbus or a Boeing jet, was going and coming in for a landing, and they actually sighted and reported a flying pink elephant to the British authorities. That is a true story. It turned out to be a weather right. balloon type thing. Right, right. But it's yeah. so funny hearing that and all sort of these of like drone sightings that they've been reporting, it all, it all makes me question and wonder. But this story, again, came from um, Ryan Wallace and Samuel M. Vance, um, and they've done that report. And which university was that at, Lloyd? Oklahoma State University. Oklahoma my State. Yep, Where you come alma from. Alma. Yes. Absolutely. So, look, I think it's a good report. It's an and I, I wouldn't trust it, but it was Oklahoma State, so I trust them. <laughs> <laughs> look, it's a, good, it's, a it's a good piece of information. I, it is. Ultimately, I keep saying everyone needs to fly safe, but the pilots that are reporting these sightings are hurting themselves in the long run where they're reporting things that they can't possibly see. Again, out of how many was it? Let me get it back on the screen again for me. It was 28 uh, out of 40 close encounters that they couldn't identify. The other 12 out of 40 in a Cessna, not in yeah. a very, very fast, you know, yeah. jet they, airliner. They I read this couldn't story see. and they did a blind, they did a blind study on it too. So, I mean, it, this is not a, you know, to see if there was any false positives on this. They really did the research. It's not like that one university that just fired a drone out of a cannon and said, oh, we can't have drones anywhere near a plane anymore. I mean, that's that's a, you know, uh, yeah, somebody wrote up Boomer. <laughs> somebody apparently <laughs> knows OU. That's, yeah, Boomer Sooners. Yeah, that's OU. Yeah. But uh -huh. no, they, uh, uh, 
this was a well done study and uh it's like you said it was done out of a cessna they were looking for it because that's what they were there for and that's why they were they were more attentive but if you're just flying along you're not going to see a drone you know it's yeah it's very and if you do you're both in a world of hurt because it's way too close and uh uh you know it if it's in the big jet yeah. it could get sucked into an engine but that's why we got to fly safe i know yeah anyway uh, let's move on next story we've only got a couple more the game of drones so we've got this video let's just play it we've talked about drone run before and this is a kickstarter campaign let's just play the video So we saw photos of this in previous weeks and um, this would actually be a really good one for a high school program to actually translate your skills into something that's measurable. So the idea of this, um, this apparatus is you take off from that particular pad, it times you, you've got to go and hit gates and you've got to do them according to the rules of the game and you can actually compare the ability of your students to go and fly safely within the rules to hit the targets, to reach the targets, and to get back and measure how quickly you can do that. Now, obviously flying safe is not all about speed, but by the same token, as you improve your skills to be able to do it. What what do you think about it, Tom? We've always loved flying. Let's get your audio up. Yeah, so this, uh, this really interests me. I'm definitely going to look into it a, a little further. I think, um, yeah, like you've been saying, r responsible drone flight is important, but when you're looking at marketable um, accuracy and precision is also highly desirable. So um, I'm definitely going to look into this a little more. And I think it's got a little bit of both, right? So you, you're timing yourself for speed, but you've got to hit those targets. So that's the accuracy of flying, both flying for speed and also for accuracy to get to the right places at the right times as well. Yes, exa exactly. And and you think about all the opportunities within uh, cinematography, videography, and and still shots. Uh, I could see, I could see this being a fantastic training platform for that. Absolutely. Well. This system is a lot like, I mean, it's, this is a drone version of, yeah, well, you and I have flown flight simulators together, uh, Greg, and part of the learning thing in there is you fly through gates. To, uh, I don't know if you've done that part yet or not, but you fly mm. through gates and that's part of the learning skill. You And this is what they're doing there. It, it improves your accuracy and with that comes a better time. You know, obviously, if, like he said, if you're filming, like Tom said, if you're, if you're out in the field you know you want to get in there get the shots get it done and move on to the next next position like those power lines you know you want to yeah. be accurate and be able to do it in a timely fashion and i i think with young people um coming from such a gaming culture any any way that you can add a little more excitement and engagement with some competition uh, a little bit of friendly competition i think is a is a fantastic thing to really draw in students yeah, I think they'd be excited by this. So really good idea. Yeah. We did, as I said, we did see the photos of it in previous um, episodes, but uh, now we've got that video. So I encourage people to go and check that out. Again, the stories, all of the links for all of these stories, where we got them from, they're in the description for the video. So do go check it out. And uh, yeah, really good program. So let's leave the news there today. We're getting up to close to the end of our show for today. And we've got one last segment that people love each and every week, which is Explore Australia. So let's go and play that now. As always, as I said a moment ago, all of the links for this material is available in the description for the video. Do go check it out. The first one comes from Drone Landscapes. The Kilcunder Bridge was constructed in 1911 for the Victorian Railways as part of the Wollami Wollamai Wanthangi Railway. It's a single track, 15 span, all timber railway bridge with a total deck length of 91 metres and a maximum height of 12 metres. 
Kilcunda Bridge came into use with the opening to traffic of all the permanent coalfields railways in 1911. The line was closed in 78. And the bridge is now part of the Bass Coast Shire Rail Trail, which was opened in 2006. Now, I read all that information out because Greg Hilton challenged me to read it before the video ended for that clip. And thank you, Greg. I did make it with time to spare. <laughs> <laughs> I was just, I was barely keeping up with what you were saying. I was going, what do you say? You <laughs> Look, say it was it just a challenge. He said he, he didn't think I could do it. And I thought, oh, that's easy. No problem. But some beautiful footage there. This is drone land capes, landscapes. Our second one today is from Burdekin Drones. And this is from Groper Creek and Wallace's in Queensland, Australia. Um, shot with a DJI Mavic 2 Zoom. Now again to our high school teacher, if any of your students have got some, um, some video clips that they want to share with us about what they're doing with their drones, we'd love to feature them on the program and share that with um, other parts of Australia and the world as we, as we broadcast each week. That'd be awesome. Yeah, I'm just thinking of some fantastic footage students have. We had some of our pilots go down and, and put together a little piece for Harmony Day this year. So they work with two different schools in the area, taking aerial photos and footage um, of, of different schools uh, for Harmony, Harmony Day, spelling out different words on the school oval. So um, yeah, I'm really excited to send some of their work in. Yeah, absolutely. And again, this one shot with um, a Mavic 2, Mavic 2 Zoom. This is one of my favorite parts of the show. I like the news, but I mean, I always enjoy Explore Australia because... I enjoy Explore I Australia because I don't there. have to think so much. I can just enjoy watching it now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah and there's you, nothing that technically that can go wrong because we've already pre-recorded it and edited it and I can just press the play button and talk. Uh, we yeah, love you're not live TV. To think it's an amazing thing. Oh, thanks. <laughs> yeah, don't we? You're used to it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm used to not being able to think right. Yeah. <clears throat> Our next clip is um, coming up in a moment from um, Matt North. I don't know if Matt's in the chat he today. Is. He's a he's a he regular. Is. In he fact, is. he is. Yep, he is in the chat. So Matt, you can you can commentate about this clip as we play it in a couple of moments. Your one's coming up very shortly. Zeb Meter's asking, how do they keep level horizon on these shots? Now, I'm going to ask the teacher, how do you keep a level horizon on your shots? What's the secret? Uh, Ooh, actually, well, let, me come, let, me, let me come back to you. I'll quickly announce this next one. So this is Matt's video. DJI Mavic Pro using ND filters, Queensland, Australia. Um, today he's going to show the difference between with ND filters and what a difference they make and versus without. Love using them now, couldn't go flying without them. So that's Matt's commentary. And again, make some extra comments, Matt, in the background in the chat room as well. So. Back to the question, how do you keep the horizon level? What's the secret? Uh, well, we're, we're constantly just trying to improve our craft, but um, yeah, we uh, shouldn't choose the GoFor 4 app um, with a lot of their photos and cinematography, but yeah, any uh, if there's anyone that wants to collaborate with us and, and help us with our still shots and cinematography, that'd be great. Yeah. Long story short is at the end of the day, it's up to the capability of your aircraft. Um, if you have not calibrated your gimbal um, or if your aircraft is not able to correctly uh, maintain that calibration during a flight, that's all you can do. There's no other magic flying that you can do to give you a nice level horizon. But again, some beautiful, beautiful um, shots from Matt there. Thanks, Matt, as always. You didn't know your stuff was in there today. Yeah. Each and every really week. <laughs> yeah. 
Each and every week, Greg Hilton goes, and he's a former ABC TV cameraman. He goes through scouring for the best of the best footage each and every week. And that's what we feature here. And that's what he's come up with today. And a link, Matt, to your channel is definitely in the description. That, Wayne, I've Matt, got that a, is some awesome, awesome stuff. I've got a question that I'll share with you in two seconds. Um, but before we do, Hazara Drone is the name of the channel. And this one's from Sugarloaf Rock in Dunsborough, Western Australia. Um, this one is Ali Mongol is the name of the pilot there and also shot with a DJI Mavic Pro 2. Um, there was a question from um, from Wayne. Uh, are you, do, you, do you use Discord at all? Have you ever used that, Tom? Uh, no, I haven't. Okay. So to answer your question, Wayne, he hasn't used it before, but very briefly, it's a um, social media kind of online chatting thing. And after the show each and every week, we sit around and have a chat about what we saw today in the show. And uh, instead of being a one-way thing where I'm talking to the audience, they have a chat back and we have a little discussion about anything of interest for the day. And uh, Wayne's just asked if you'll be in Discord after the show. So maybe, maybe not, we'll see. <laughs> Yep, I'll our have last, a look into it. <laughs> okay. Our last video, Jubilee Point, Mornington Peninsula in uh, Victoria. The, the original footage is in 4K. Obviously, we're not broadcasting in 4K, thanks to the internet. But anyway, this is shot by Australia by Drone is the name of the channel. Now, I've got, I'm going to have to talk to this guy. Australia by Drone versus Oz by Drone. I think there's a bit of a, bit of a conflict of interest there. I was going to say, it could be copyright infringement <laughs> uh, it's all good but if he's a bit if he does better video than you let's keep him i mean uh Oi. <laughs> 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 sorry did i say that out loud yeah <laughs> So while we're waiting here, a few um, quick little announcements. Next week is going to be something very, very special. Next week, we've got the Edinburgh Air Show, which I believe is happening down in your neck of the woods. Is that right, Tom? Uh, yeah, we'll be out there on Friday and we also have a booth set up there over the weekend. So. Okay. So next week, we've, yes. got two, we've got two special guests next week. We've got the Australian Army. Um, who were responsible for the military international drone racing tournament which happened last year and um, certainly they'll be at the air show and they'll be coming in live we'll be interviewing them but we've got another special secret we've got the historical aviation restoration society HARS and as it happens my next door neighbor is actually one of the senior leaders of that organization. She's going to be at the air show with five aircraft, including the famous Catalina. So she'll be coming in live from the show, showing us some of her aircraft. We we did talk about her, you know, being on board one of her planes while they're doing a flight. But the challenge is those old aircraft, they weren't designed for 4G mobiles. <laughs> so maybe that won't be possible. But certainly that's next week as well. <coughs> It should be a very big one. Yeah, that ought to be a great show. Can I tell them about the time difference between Edinburgh and uh, oh no Sydney? <laughs> <laughs> I got to tell. Okay, I was sitting. I was sitting here in this same chair doing what I'm doing right here, and we were we were skyping together. And Greg gets this call from the. Uh, uh, Edinburgh, Australian Army. somebody from the Edinburgh show. Yeah, the Australian Army said they were going to be in Edinburgh. He says, well, are we going to pre-record this or what? He says, because, you know, when I go live, it's going to be the middle of the night for you. And he says, no, Edinburgh, Australia, not Scotland. <laughs> <laughs> and he didn't know I could hear all this. I was listening to it. I was just cracking up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. But, yeah. Okay. Anyway, so those are a couple of coming soons. Um, also, we're going to have Kelly Shaw's. Um, I don't know exactly which week, but he's agreed to be our guest. 
I want to actually, before we go, have one more quick little panel discussion with yourself and maybe with Tom as well, if he's got a couple of minutes. Here's a question. So my local council at a location that it's a beach down at Cronulla and they've, they've gone and erected signs, no drones flying over here. Um, it's not a restricted area as far as CAS is concerned. I'm curious, Tom, what's your view? I'll start with you. I, I guess from um, our perspective, if it's a, not a restricted area, people have checked their proximity to uh, control towers. They're the outside of the three nautical miles. It's, I guess it's area there. So I think that would be very much subject to interpretation. Um, yeah. Whether that was constantly a populous area um, and flying kind of outside the 30 metres of people would also need yeah. to be considered. Uh, so, yeah, that's a very interesting one. Um, I might throw that out to my students next week, actually. Yeah, look, the reason why I bring it up is it's, it's the only location in the Shire that I live in. And I'll quickly pause for a minute. I need to give a quick thank you to Fly Natural for your super chat. Thank you very much for that. $4.99. Appreciate it. Yep. And uh, US Absolutely. dollars, it'll be a little bit more for us over here. Thanks for that. Um, so here's my challenge with that. CASA is the exclusive regulator of airspace. We know that. Number two, CASA and their applications say this is the only, th this is not a prohibited location. And I checked, council didn't have any meetings or discussions or policy documents to go and suddenly unilaterally make this change. And unfortunately, they've done that without consulting the community. Council didn't actually do it. Some you know, government employee thought it was a good idea to ban drones there. And the next thing you know, it's, it's banned. Now, having said that, there is a heliport that is close to that location, but it's an emergency heliport that's used about two times a year. Now, you and I both know, Tom, that you, you can't uh, fly when there's a helicopter landing or taking off or in the air, etc. And I've flown in that location myself many, many times. It's the only slope soaring location in the Sutherland Shire. And all of a sudden, drones are bad. And it, it frustrates me. I don't know. How do we educate the community that drones are not bad? Uh, yeah, that's a that's a really good question, and I think um, it's it just goes uh, down to more education, more education for young or uh, celebrations, I guess, of good examples of responsible drone operation. And I, I think it's always the issue where you've got, um, I guess, the the small minority that operate drones uh, irresponsibly um, that mm. that ruin it for the majority. So, um, yeah, I think it's just more focus on education and really celebrating uh, the, the benefits of the technology and the advantages of the technology, um, not just really focusing on the isolation um times where where they've that they're an issue yeah absolutely oh and tom we've just had a donation um from zeb meet that's um been requested to be sent to your school so i'll make sure that that gets across to you it's 10 bucks ten dollars us so if anyone else wants to give to tom and you specifically say in the in the message that you want to give it to tom and to the school there um, before we finish today, I'll make sure that that happens. Um, less the YouTube tax that they put on there, but I'll make <laughs> sure Tom gets the rest. Yeah, but with uh, the yeah. uh, uh, that's, with that's the trade difference, really you're going to make some money. Uh, greatly appreciated, and um, yeah, if people are okay, it's live. Hello, everyone. We're still live, maybe. Um, in case you're wondering, at that exact moment, we had two things happen. Wirecast died, but also the internet in my area. I just got alerts on my phone that the internet in my area went down, so we had a double whammy. I think we're live going out again. I just wanted to finish off and say thank you very much for watching. Thanks for being part of our regular show. A couple of quick announcements at the end today. By the way, open the Rendezvous dashboard. We'll get Lloyd back at least. So number one, the viewer video, as always, if you send it to 
that email address. If you want to send your videos in, we'll make sure that we have a look at that. If you want to follow us on social media, just reconnect to the existing session at the bottom to my producer there. Reconnect down the bottom. And last but not least, our postal address is 5 slash 127 Princes Highway, Sylvania, New South Wales, 224 Australia. Now, I can't hear either of the guests at the moment. You may need to put them back into the shots to my producer. So we've got Lloyd on the screen there, but unfortunately he is looking very big. That's due to a Wirecast bug. So thank you, Telestream, for that. Can we hear him? No. Okay, can you ah, hear me now? We go. We've got him. We've got him. Can you reapply right. the template on that shot to my producer, my wife, please? Thank you. All right. So those are our announcements. And I'll just say again, Lloyd, we, Wirecast crashed and the internet died at the same time. And earlier today, we had all of the other fun happenings. By the way, speaking of Wirecast, well, I, do, I do want to share, you and I before the show, we were trying to test to get you on the screen and I kept on getting a black screen. And Right. Uh, and did it go down and, again? Uh, my wife's talking to me about something. Okay. Do we want to put Tom in the screen? Uh, we'll just, we'll finish off. We'll just finish off with Lloyd for now. That's fine. So any last words from you, Lloydie? No, I do want to say real quick for anybody uh, that has been following my wife, uh, we went to the doctor today and we got very good news. Uh, well, as good as we can get about 98% sure it was an infection. It was not cancer. So uh, she goes back in two months just to do a follow up because this was one of those situations they wanted. Uh, but he's so that's the good thing. Uh, the cancer wasn't there. So. That's what I'm happy about. <laughs> really now, good just message. Just get the internet and I'll show you to work. We'll be happy. It'll be a great the world. The internet and Wirecast and that'll do. Yeah. Again, <laughs> anyone, who, anyone who does a um, super chat for the remainder of the show today and they specifically say uh, they want it to go to Tom and the school there, we'll go and make sure that gets funneled through. At the moment, we've got $9.99 US. By the time we take out the YouTube, I think it's 30%. Um, we'll see what that number is, but who knows? There might be some more and we'll make sure we get that to the school. So we'll start the end of the show credits and the music. So thanks for watching. Thanks for being part of today's show. Don't miss next week where we'll be visiting live at the Edinburgh South Australia uh, Festival. So thanks very much for watching. Bye for now.